middle of nowhere, there are untold stories. In the middle of nowhere, there are stars waiting to shine. In the middle of nowhere short film competition, there are cash money prizes. Start now on your three-minute film, finished by the September 22nd deadline, and you can see your masterpiece on the silver screen. Join us for the award ceremony and screening October 21st in Havelock's Joyo Theater. The middle of nowhere short film competition. For more information, log on to NIFP.org. Brought to you by Nebraska Independent Film Projects. We were so happy that there were other people that were doing what we were doing and were just as crazy as we were, in some cases overtly so, and other people hid it very well. But, you know, there was just this, whoa, you know, you like that too, or whoa, that's weird, but that's okay. You know, mm -hmm. it, was, it was a group for people who were accepting of other people's oddities. I want to thank all the filmmakers and all their friends for here tonight. This is an excellent turnout. Uh, this is absolutely incredible. Okay, sounds good. This is free form. Free form, good. And we're okay. Do you want to okay. do you want to mark this because I'm still yeah. rolling? Just do that for me, please. Give, do that again. I'm sorry. There we go. There we go. Okay. Uh, please give me your name and spell it for posterity. Lori L O R I Vidlak V I D L A K. I believe I always wanted to make educational films and when I moved to Nebraska I thought there was something that still existed called the Mid-America something or other that made educational films. Unfortunately it had shut down several years before I moved here, didn't know that, and started to take some classes from John Spence at the university in film, especially like animation. Uh, John and I started to work together on film projects. You know, professional racers have been supporting strong safety measures in the track for years. Recently, millions of people across America have joined the racing fraternity in supporting safety belt use laws. Believe me, driving on our streets and highways can be every bit as dangerous as driving on the track. So congratulations, America, for supporting safety belt use laws. It's a law we can live with. Some of the work that we did was commercial work, and because it was commercial work, we were paid for it. But there were other projects that we wanted to do that were our own ideas, and for those kinds of projects, you needed grant funding, unless you were going to put your own money into it, and neither of us had any. <laughs> so, um, we had some ideas for projects that we thought could be funded through grants from organizations like the Humanities Council or the Arts Council or other organizations that might be interested in a particular topic. Once we started to explore specific topics, we recognized that you could not get these grants as individuals. You had to be part of a what they called a 501c3 organization, which is a special tax status that the IRS awards to educational and charitable organizations. So we at first started, as I recollect, to affiliate ourselves with existing 501c3 organizations that were associated with our topic area. Um, our uh, perhaps an art organization or a museum organization. I believe we affiliated with a museum organization for when I did the Robert Henry film, which was one of the films I wanted to pursue. 
Um, but what you found when you um, affiliated with another nonprofit organization was there was always a board of directors where your proposal had to go through that and there was always lots of discussion about it. The organization itself had its own agenda and may want some things into a project that maybe you as a producer didn't feel were necessary or important. And being that we were independent people, we didn't like this idea that we had other folks to answer to. And it became increasingly difficult to find not-for-profit 501c organizations that would give us the freedom to be independent filmmakers. Um, for our projects. So we decided to create an organization of independent filmmakers and make that be a charitable and educational entity that would get that IRS status. So that's what the NIFP became. It was a long application, but I was working with both John and Mel Bucklin, and Mel was a great writer. So it wasn't that difficult because we knew what we wanted to say. We wrote it down. One of us edited, either her or me, I can't remember. Um, and it was pretty cut and dry. I guess I knew from writing grant applications already that you tell them, you answer their questions, you know, clearly, as clearly and succinctly as possible. And so that's what we did. Um, a lawyer would typically be involved in submitting that paperwork. Um, and so Mel had a friend who was a lawyer who could do that, who did that, submitted it for, you know, not much money, if any. I can't recall, but it wasn't a lot. So it was primarily time spent, you know, writing the application. And as, as I remember, it came back with some questions that the IRS had of us. Um, so it took a long time. I think, you know, initially they said six months to a year. I think we got our answers back and probably within that, or the questions back within that length of time. Then we had to answer it, had to change some things. Um, because they were looking for specific things in order to give you that educational or charitable status. And even though it started as originally a project to um, allow us to write grants for film projects, we saw pretty quickly that to be an educational organization, we really needed to focus on trying to form an organization that would help educate other filmmakers about not only the process of making films, getting dollars to make films, but also filmmaking itself. And so it grew from that to be kind of a support group for helping, um, helping film, other filmmakers achieve their dreams, but also uh, an educational thing. I remember very well that we had young people come to our meetings and I know a boy came with his mother. I just thought that was great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there was a lot of that, but it was a lot of, as I recall those early meetings, it was kind of empowerment meetings, helping people see that it could be done. It might be a struggle, but everybody had gone through some things and they had stories to tell and lessons that they could share with other people and help them get over the humps. John had very little patience and still does with any bureaucracy. So while Mel and I were like, yeah, we can get this, don't worry about it, you know, anything bureaucratic mm, was problematic for Spence. So I believe our initial meetings were at uh, ETV, uh, Nebraska Educational Television, and met in the boardroom there for a little while, and then we were offered or procured a spot at Telepro, um, which was across the street from N Street Liquor Store, which was the draw, and um, began meeting there. Small group at first, as I remember, but it seemed to grow monthly. There were some university students that came. Um, 
and it just started to catch on word of mouth I think you know that was back in the day there was no Facebook there was no email that I can remember really to speak not too much of that anyway um, so that was a long time ago because Telepro was a great location Perfect. because you were in the midst of production right. of a production facility had lots of shiny blinking things. That's yes, right. shiny right. blinking things That's were very right. appropriate, yes, for that group. And then we started to show um, samples of things we were working on, and that was cool, and get critiques. I remember that. That was kind of neat. And, um, and you know, we did a good job of trying. You know, I think the thing that I liked about that group um, was it was about supporting each other. It wasn't about competing with each other. You know, people learned um, early on that if they had a project, there was a group of cheerleaders that was going to help them in whatever way they could, offer props or their own time or advice or just not say anything bad. Um, so that was, I think that was really great to see that there was that body of people that didn't seem competitive. Those critique sessions um, morphed eventually into someone's wonderful idea, and I don't know who it was, to have public showings of projects that group members were working on or had completed and so and I remember the first one was called Mad Movie Night. Um, it was before the era of YouTube, before a lot of venues opened for that. At one point um, in the evolution of NIFP we had a member who had acquired a large collection of old 16 millimeter educational films from the public library and decided to get them out of his house and somehow gift them to the NIFP. So we got a collection of the old films, which I frankly loved because I always wanted to make educational films and here they were. And some of them were terribly hilarious many black and white um, films and also he gave us a 60 millimeter projector or he had also acquired that from the library or somebody did because we got a 60 millimeter projector and then we could show the films. <laughs> to say no. That's the subject under discussion. And there are plenty of times in life when you have to say no. Fortunately, sometimes it's easy. No. Well, thanks for asking me, but no. Yes, sometimes just plain no is best. But sometimes such a direct no would offend people, cause you to lose your friends, make you seem to disapprove of them. And if you just take a subscription for only one year, I can get that bicycle. Well, new suit, new hat, new gloves. Do you like them? Well... So then that morphed into this idea of creating this mad movie night where we could show um, projects that members had done but also these crazy old 60s, 50s, 40s educational films. We did posters, we did that kind, we knew that having some kind of a special event, public special event was the way to get attention and I think we got media attention. I think we got a news article or something in the paper which also really helped. Mm -hmm and we took advantage of that because again we had no internet to get that word out. So as part of our educational mission 
uh, we thought that it would be a good idea to not only have our small meetings, but also do kind of large workshop events. And so we put together two of those. One was about sound production and used a fellow named Ginsburg. <laughs> From the West Coast, we flew him in. Oh. Hmm. Again, Mel must have had that contact, I would guess, or somehow something. Someone had a contact. That's the beauty of these kinds of organizations is somebody always knows somebody. So we had one workshop on sound production with a fellow from California that we flew in. We must have written a grant to fund that. Um, and then we had another workshop uh, with Lou Hunter, a, a screenwriter who hailed from Superior, Nebraska. And we had one, if not several, with him. And it was very successful. And we charged, I believe, people to come to that one. So one of the events that we also had was the showing of a well-known, at least at that time, underground goofy film called Attack of the Killer Tomatoes that turned out to have been made by someone who was later a park ranger at the Homestead Monument in Beatrice. Well, I think that we were dedicated to trying to fulfill the IRS requirement that we be educational. And the more we thought about it, the more ideas we had about how to be educational that we probably didn't have when we first wrote the grant wrote the application for the IRS status. We, we had no idea where it would go. And once you get a group of people together and then you start allowing them to all share their ideas and there is no one real leader, that was the other thing, I think, that we didn't have a very strong leader person. I know a lot of the nonprofits uh, that are created are created because there's a, this founder person, this person that somehow has this vision of what they want this organization to be and then they fulfill the vision and bring other people into it who, they, who either share the vision or who they convince later to share the vision. Those of us who started this really never had a vision. <laughs> <laughs> for what this was going to be. And no one wanted to be the leader. I mean, and that may still be the case today, but it was a group of independent people who frankly didn't want to lead other people. They all wanted to do their own little project. And, um, but when you allow those, all those voices to come together and you're open to that, nobody was naysaying things. It was like, oh, sure, we'll try that. You know, why not? 